afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the United States. This is George Hicks, the National Broadcasting Company. This is the World Series of 1937. We're speaking from our box directly behind home plate on the lip of the third tier at Yankee Stadium in New York City. Well, you fans don't need to have me tell you what this is all about. It's the New York Yankees World Champions of 1936. Again, tennis winners this year in the American League versus the New York Giants. National League champions of 1937 and for the World Championship in baseball. And this is the fifth World Series since the beginning in 1905 between the two New York teams. Well, we've been in our chairs here since 11 a.m. this morning. Now 1.15. The bleachers bending in an irregular curve from middle left field around to middle right were packed solid on our arrival this morning. And the third tier of moderate price reserve seats were also packed at that time, except the extreme tips at left and right field, and now they're filling up. The expensive boxes and first layer tier are now filled practically, except for the last moment arrivals. There must easily be 50,000 or a little more here now before game starts, and they're still pouring in. NBC has its baseball expert manning the microphones. Tom Manning, NBC sports announcer from Cleveland, one of the best. Well, he'll describe the first half of the game. Beside him is Red Barber, star sports announcer from station WLW in Cincinnati. Both, uh, by the way, are red-headed. So remember, when the action gets hot, these two red-headed flashes will be throwing the words at you. And with them is Warren Brown, the friendly and wise ball expert, sports editor of the Chicago Herald Examiner. He'll give you the expert opinion, the inside facts that only he knows. Now, so much for what's to come. Right now, the Yanks are just potting in off the diamond. The caretakers are out with their rakes and the chalk lines, the manicuring, which goes on just before the game starts. It's just about 10 minutes now. The photographers are flashing balls at the, at the first row box seat where all the celebrities are seated. It's so muggy today, incidentally, that they're using flash balls. The Giants are now coming into their dugout. The weather is humid. Uh, whether this is October 6th or not, uh, perspiration is running off our faces, and the bleachers are in shirt sleeves, making that white background. Uh, it rained last night here in New York, but now the sky is a pale blue with those low, steamy clouds breaking and floating right over our heads and the pennants up on top of the horseshoe. But boy, it's thick and it's hot out here, but I, I'm sure it won't rain. Mayor LaGuardia is here. Oh, Vicki Cochran, the old, the old Mike of Detroit, looking fit again. And the babe, Genio, he was wiping his face a moment ago in a blue serge suit. Sits in a box right down below us beside the Yankee dugout. With him is Mrs. Ruth and his daughter, uh, Jacob Rupert. Genio, handsome, smiling with Mayor LaGuardia. Uh, Mr. Rupert stood and shook hands with the babe while the photographers took their pictures. Cheers and excitement, the comments running like fire through the stands that uh, have been uh, egging us on since noon when the audience follows DiMaggio, Gary, Dickey, Selkirk, Moore, and Ott, all the sluggers as they drop their long drives into either left or right field stand. Uh, the Giants today are the visitors. Uh, they're in gray with bright azure blue caps, uh, blue shirt sleeves and socks. The Yanks in white with uh, dark blue caps and socks. The crowd got a, got a terrific howl a few moments ago when Gomez put a long punch into the right field stand. Uh, at batting practice uh, about 12.30, when the Giants came in, Hubble got a fine hand when he came to bat. But the best he could do was to ground to the infield. The crowd uh, also cheered young Jack McCarthy, first baseman of the Giants, when he put several long drives into right field stand. And uh, they said, well, uh, uh, look at who we got here, as much as to say, well, this boy is right up there with Garrick and DeMaggio. Uh, a quarter of a mile away on the top of the apartment roofs, which uh, are jagged in modernistic style, are the, the apartment roof galleryites uh, who pay no tickets and who get a very much of a bird's eye view of the entire scene. Hub is now 
down behind home plate on the giant side, warming up, taking his time, wipes his head with his shirt sleeve, puts his old left arm across, and there's the ball. Gomez is doing the same thing on the Yankee side. The photographers are squatted around them, and the caretakers are now laying out their chalk marks around home plate and the batter's boxes. The band is playing in center field. Pause for a moment for the last speaker announcement, which said for the people in the aisles to please take their seats. It's just minutes now before the beginning of history in baseball for 1937. The green stands are packed, red, white, and blue bunting on all sides, excitement growing, and now that's the general scene. Let's get down to what this really means. Beside me is Warren Brown that I spoke to you about. Warren, come on and give us the facts about 1937. All right, George, this is really the most exciting series, or I anticipate that it will be the most exciting series of the sort of a traditional rivalry that has grown up between the New York Giants and the New York Yankees. As you have been told, or perhaps know already, this is the fifth meeting between these two clubs. They met for the first time in 1921. And baseball history of sorts has been made since then. In 1921, for example, there was no Yankee Stadium. Both of the New York clubs played in the Polo Grounds, which is across the Harlem River. In the 1921 series, the New York Giants were tops in baseball. John McGraw was leading them, and they were a fiery baseball club. In my judgment, the club that Bill Terry is sending out on the field this afternoon is the best New York club since the heyday of McGraw. In that 1921 series, the uh, games were played on the basis of five out of nine rather than the four out of seven, which had existed in earlier years and which has been brought back into play now. In that 1921 series, the Giants won five and the Yankees won three. The following year, 1922, the Giants won again, and they won four games. The Yankees didn't win any. That was the return to the four out of seven, as far as the Giants and Yankees were concerned. The Yankees started to get going in 1923, which was the third successive year that Yankees and Giants played in the World Series. And the thought strikes me now, as I've looked at these two pennant races in the National or American League, that maybe we're back to those old days again. The Giants and Yankees won last year. And they won again this year, having proven conclusively in their respective leagues that they were far and away the best ball clubs in those leagues. So it is quite possible that we may have another stretch of three years, or possibly more, of these all-New York series, the Subway series, as they call them. In 1923, when the Yankees won the World's Championship from the Giants, they won four, and the Giants won two. After that, the Yankees fell apart a little bit, and it took them a little while to rebuild until they came back stronger than ever. The Giants won another pennant in 1924, but they didn't have the Yankees as their opponents in the World Series that year. Thus it was we came into 1936 before the two clubs met again. And, of course, we will all remember that the Yankees won a really sensational series here last year, four games out of six. Summing up then, we find that down through these four series that have been played to date, the Giants have won 13 games, and the Yankees have won 11, which seems to me to bring the two teams very close. In a sense, then, this series, which begins today, being the fifth, is a rubber series. Unless, of course, we figure that they're going to keep right on going again next year. These meetings between the Giants and the Yankees have been productive of some sensational baseball, some very colorful things. Some of the strangest things that have ever happened in World Series play have happened when the Giants were meeting the Yankees was in one of these series that we had the famous episode in which a plate umpire declared that it was dark when very few people in the park thought it was dark, with the result that the Commissioner Landis, who, to whom the uh, decision of the umpire came as much of a stunning surprise as to anybody else, decided to give the money that was spent for those tickets to charity. That was one of the more famous incidents of this giant Yankee series. There were a lot of uh, strange plays and a lot of sensational plays. But that's almost enough for the past. Let us get to the present. Looking at the lineups today, which the loudspeaking system is about to give you, perhaps I should pause and let you hear that.
now the pitchers and the catchers and the umpires. Gomez versus Hubble, which we've been expecting this meeting between the two representative left-handers of their respective leagues. As I look through the batting orders and the lineups of the two teams, I find one thing that must be of interest to far off California. I notice that the New York Yankees in their starting lineup have no less than five out of their nine ball players come from California. Ladies and gentlemen, the national anthem. Strike on 
is out. Gary on a distance. One man down in the first inning of this first game of the World Series. And little Dick Bartell. Right hand hitter. Short stop of the Giants is next. He's a little fellow, but he can hit that ball with a far corner. Dick is 29 years old. This year he batted 306. Lefty Gomez. The pitch. Umpire tosses out a new ball to Bill Dickey. You know, Bill Dickey is one of the tallest catchers ever to come into the major leagues. Man, what a catcher. First inning, one man out, nobody on. Lefty Gomez. Ball, it's too high. It was a fastball, very high, and the count on Dick Bartell, ball one, and strike one. First inning, one man out, nobody on. Martell. Have the outfield moved over just a little bit toward right field. Left center and right field are playing over a bit. There's a base hit. Just inside the bag. Down the left field corner. Turns off the wall. Hope has it. The throw to second drives him back to first base. And it's a base hit for Dick Martell. That was a ripping smash just inside the third base cushion. The ball going down the left field corner. It turned off the turning the ball to Frank Rossetti and driving Dick Bartell back to first base. Carol the knock. The giant third baseman. It seems rather strange to say the giant third baseman. For many years, he was the right fielder. Here's the pitch. Strike call. A beautiful hook ball. It caught the inside corner of the plate with Carol the knock stepping back. First inning, one man out. Dick Bartell on first. Carol the knock, left-hand batter, is in the box. Ball two. A slow, sweeping curveball that missed the outside corner, and the count on Mel is one and one. George Hicks told you it's kind of a dark day. What's the advantage of Gomez? It's a high foul ball going in the box is over and back of third base, and it's strike two. Strike two and ball one. Very, very few vacant seats upstairs. The last is two tiers. And in the mezzanine, the last tier and a half. And on the main floor, just the last tier. The same thing is prevalent in the right field corner. The pitch. The high fly ball infield. Luke Gehrig. Luke Gehrig under it. He has it. Two out. Dick Bartell on first. And Hank Lieber coming up. Hank Lieber. We'll be in center field this afternoon. Jimmy Ripple in right field and Joe Moore in left field. It was thought for a while that Chiozzi might play center field for the Giants, but that has been changed, and Lieber will be in center. Here it is. Ball one. Last ball was over, but just a little bit too high. Hank Lieber. That's some right-handed. This is the first inning. Two out. Nick Bartell on first. It's a foul back. The hit and run was on that time. Dick Bartell was off with lefty Gomez motion. Ran all the way down to second base. And now he trots back. The umpires warms me behind the bat. Far is at first. Steve Bass was at second. And Bill Stewart umpiring at third. Of course, the umpires will shift around each day. Rotate. All right. The count of Lieber strike one. Ball one. Strike two. Makes a mighty swing. He wasn't fooling on that one. Swung hard and missed it. And the count is strike two and ball one. The Giants being the visiting club today, batting first. Two men out. Bartell on first. Here it is. Inside. Lefty Gomez thought he had a corner on that one, but it was inside. And the count is strike two and ball two. DiMaggio and Selkirk are playing plenty deep. Two and two, coming. Strike three. 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 No errors. Play a ball game. Warren, come in. Yes, Tom, and the noticeable thing in that first half inning was the respect that the Giants evidently have for the throwing 
arms of the Yankee outfielders. That ball that Martell hit over third base was normally one on which he would try for second base, but he made his round of first and half-heartedly and then turned back to first. They evidently have heard that the arms of Hogue and DiMaggio and that Yankee outfield can throw that ball around. The other noticeable thing to which I think we might as well refer now is that the rains of last night have slowed down this field to a considerable extent. I notice that as the boys run around out there, they're digging up large uh, sort of divots in the turf, and I'm afraid that there will not be any too much speed shown until the place dries out a little. And as the sun is now coming out strong, it probably will be dry and, as they say, at the track fast before the afternoon is over. Gomez, in striking out uh, Lieber to end the inning, departed from his orthodox fashion of firing that ball through there. The last strike was slowed up, and it threw Lieber completely off his stride, and it was an interesting pitch. All right, Tom, here's the first chance. Mike, keep this in mind. Brennan and Gumbert going out the right field bullpen to warm up. It'll be Carl Hubble, you know, left hand with the box for the Giants. Charles won 22 and lost eight. 33 years old, long, lanky left-hander. The first hitter will be Frank Rossetti. Play the wind-up. Ball one. A hook ball was low inside. Rossetti wiggling around up there. Stepped away, took it, and the count is one and nothing. Matt Rolfe, the Yankee third baseman, will be next. Hubble bending over now. He's taking just a little bit of time. He always starts off rather slow and along about the fourth inning. Cups it up a little. Ball one. Inside. And the count is two and nothing. On that giant infield is well out at third base. Dick Bartell at short. Burgess Whitehead at second. And Johnny McCarthy at first. Hubble is in the box. And Mancuso doing the catch. Goes out up. The count ball two. The pitch. Strike ball. A burning fastball right down the old alley. About felt high. Frankie Crosetti jumping away from the plate. Ormsby called it, and the count is called two and strike one. A lot of pepper on that giant infield for the moment. Outside, and it's ball three. Ball three and strike one. For that count, ball two and strike one. Hubble tried to come in there with a sweeping curve ball over the outside, making Rossetti reach for it, but he refused. Ball was outside, and it's ball three and strike one. No score as yet. Frank Rossetti, first man up for the Yankees in the last half of the first inning. And he got that outfield of Joe Moore in left, Hank Lieber in center, Jimmy Ripple in right. Ball three and strike one. Rossetti, right-hander up. Outside, ball four, and Rossetti walks. Brett Rolfe, Pepperie's third baseman, Matson, left hand. The Yankee uniforms are white, the home uniform white, the blue stripe, about an inch apart. They're wearing navy blue jerseys, blue caps, blue stockings. The NY, of course, on the top of their cap. Carl Hubble, giant pitcher with the left hander, takes a stretch, a peek at first. Here it is. It's in there. A call strike. Nice sharp breaking curve ball that Red Roll started to dart away from. Just broke over the heart of the plate for a call strike. Joe DiMaggio will be next. Looks he has a big lead. Has a play at first. No go. Just to let him know that you're in there. Hubble tossing that ball over with not any great amount of effort. Strike one to come. It's outside. Sharp breaking curve ball is plenty low and outside. Gus Mancuso jumping over for it. Not even the count on Rolf. Ball one and the strike one. There's the stretch. Peek over to first. There's a play at first. Not even close. Grosetti getting back fast. Hubble wasn't burning that ball over to Johnny McCarthy, just letting Rosetti know that he's in there. Ball one and strike one coming. It's outside and low. Hubble shook his head a little on that. 
Burgess will turn around and talk to Orm Feet. Burgess White at the second base was walked in from his spot, yelling something at Hubble. Hubble picks up the rosin bag now. Now he's kicking the dirt around on the top of the rubber there. Nalana's playing pretty deep third base. Hit runners on, fly ball and back at third base. And it's two and two. That's at least a glimpse of what Joe McCarthy, the manager of the Yankees, might be doing in this series. Instead of getting that sacrifice and playing for the one run, that count ball two and strike one, he puts a hit run on. Earl Combs coaching at first, Arnie Fletcher at third. The count is ball two, strike two. Rosetti on first, result of a base on balls and nobody else. Hubble pitching. Two and two, over to first base. Tossed over there with sort of nonchalantly. Third time he's tossed over there with no particular speed on that toss from the box. Here it is. Smack outside, ball ball. Fans jumped to their feet then. That was a very hard smack. The ball turned all the way around on. Pulled it a little bit too much. It landed about two yards outside the first base cushion. One of the boys that will bear a lot of watching in this short Blue Ribbon Classic will be Johnny McCarthy. who will replace manager Bill Terry at first base. Ed Rolf is in there with the count ball two and strike two. And goes any on first, nobody out. Whitehead 
ahead at second, but Grosetti gets back. Now we have Luke Gehrig coming up. Gehrig and Old Batchel, left-handed. Luke's been heading 353 this season. And he's 33 years old. Hasn't missed a ball game since the Lord knows when. Double pitching. Here it is. Fadeaway curveball. Missed the outside corner. And it's ball one. Frank Grosetti is on second. DiMaggio on first. Just a couple of Italian boys that know something about this game called baseball. Ball one, Gary Kidding. Here it is. The long drive, high and far out, but not going too far away. Hank Lieber is under it, and he has it. Returns the ball to Burgess Whitehead. Rosetti holding second. DiMaggio holding first. Gary got a hold of that ball, but the confines of this Yankee Stadium, you know, are plenty long, and the boys took that ball out there, not quite out to the center track. Let me give you the figures on this field. It's 301 feet to the left field corner, then the right left field is 402 feet. Directly in center field is 461. Right center is 407, and on the line in left field is 296 feet. Of course, it branches out within 30 or 40 feet of that. It's 344 feet back. Right now, we have two men out, and Bill Zicky at bat, the catcher, left-hand batter. Outside, ball one. Carl Hubble leading almost back to second base before he cut loose for that ball. Apparently, he's trying to keep that ball over the lower outside corner for Bill Zickey. Nick Bartellis moves over toward the second base cushion. Strike, ball. Ball one, strike one. Frank Rosetti on second. Joe DiMaggio on first, two men out. Walt struck out. Gary flies to Lieber in center field. Left-hander is in the box for the Giants. Ball one, strike one. Takes a look at second base. Here it is. Strike two with Chip Powell, as you can perhaps hear. That's Mancuso making the catch of the ball. And the count is strike two and ball one. Holy smoke, there's a lot of excitement here at Yankee Stadium. The folks have been waiting, you know. It's 12 months for this classic. Down on Bill Dickey now is strike two and ball one. Side of the count is two and two. Earl Holt was playing out in left field against the south ball shoots of Carl Hubble is next. The other left fielder is Jakey Powell. Ball two and strike two. Hubble takes the stretch. It is. Tip foul. Dickey swung over that ball, landed right there home plate. Whips out a new ball and the Giants smack it around that infield with the rapidity of life. Malak, Dick Bartell, the Whitehead to McCarthy, and then back to the pitcher Hubble. The giant outfield is Joe Moore in left, Hank Lieber in center, and Jimmy Ripple in right. Maggio on first, Rosetti on second, two out, Dickey batting, ball two, strike two. Coming. Ball three. A burning fast ball. Bill Dickey away from the plate. Haven't had so much on it, but it brought a great groan from the crowd. Must be attendance for him, somewhat over 60. Give me the figures on the attendance, just to see if we're made the better of the blood. Full count of three and two, the runners will be off with the pitch. There they go, and here it is. The fly ball going out of the deep center field. Hank Lieber running back. Under it, and he has it. That's all for the Yankees in the first inning. No run. One hit, one base on ball, and no error. And our radio friends, we pause briefly for station identification. NBC booth in the Yankee Stadium, and the thought that strikes me after watching the Yankees' first attempt at Carl Hubble's pitching in this game is 
that hump has been a little bit wild to the extent that he's been three and two on most of these hitters. He's been working that ball towards the corners there, pitching very carefully for the simple reason that it is not a good judgment to get that ball any too good for these Yankee hitters. While he was hit for one base hit, the one that Joe DiMaggio flashed past to Mel Ott at third base, that was a sort of a soggy hit, and it wasn't hit with the authority that we are accustomed to watch when the Yankees really get a hold of the ball. So far in the ball game, it has been mostly one of defense with the Yankees furnishing the principal threat, of which, as you know now, nothing came. All right, Tom, it looks like the hitter's up here, so let's have him. Well, it'll be Jimmy Ripple, a giant white fielder. We completed the first inning without any score. One hit apiece. Carl Hubble has issued one base on balls. So far, Lefty Gomez has issued no bases on balls. Jimmy Ripple leading off. Jimmy's left-hand hitter, the right fielder of the Giants. Here we go. Ball one. That was a fast ball that Gomez had in there, but it was just a little bit too low. Johnny McCarthy will be next. Ball, ball, up and back at third base. Ball one, strike one. Yes, Jimmy broke his bat. Hitting that ball, that's what he did, and he's walking slowly over toward the giant dugout to get a new one. One thing that the ball players just hate to do is to break their back. Tell me, Warren, how'd that ever start? What is that? Well, this broken bat that sort of burns the boys up. Well, that's just one of those superstitions that's come along in baseball, like somebody who started to hit by wearing their pants long, you know. They used to pull them all up in the old days. One fellow started in like Cal Simmons or somebody like that with his pants down loose. And now pretty nearly everybody does. Ready to go again. Ball one and strike one. Ripple hitting. There's a long smash going out to left field. Merle Hogue waiting for it. He has it. Jimmy Ripple with the count. Ball one and strike one. Fly to Merle Hogue in medium left field. Johnny McCarthy. First year as a regular with the Giants. I like him here in New York. He's getting a nice hand. He steps into the batter's box. He backs and throws left-handed. Lefty Gomez. Outside, ball one. It's awful muggy and awful dark here at the moment. A little wind blowing in from the northwest. There's a smash right up with Jerry. And he makes the catch. He looked at the umpire. The umpire, Steve Basil, waved that it was a unassisted put out. Looked as though Tony just barely got his glove underneath that ball. A terrific line smashed right at Tony's feet. He held the ball up and Steve Basil waved out that Tony Lazari made the catch. Two out. Nobody on. First half of the second inning. Thanks, George. Dutch Van Cuso up. Strike call. Just 31 years old. This season he batted 279. At Yankee outfield, Hogan left DiMaggio center, saw Kurt right. The pitch gets a ball. Ball and inside. Ball one and strike one. The wind up. That's a long smash into right center field. Saw Kurt going over fast and he has it. Very nice running catch by right fielder Georgie Selkirk. Mancuso hitting that ball on a line in the right center field. Selkirk was off to the track of the bat and made the catch. One. Tom, the uh, noticeable thing there was the fact that all three of these Yankee hitters, or giant hitters, and two of them left-hand hitters, took very solid wallops at the ball. Perhaps the hardest hit of the game to date in the fourth of effectiveness was that line drive that McCarty hit out at Lazari out there. It's interesting to me to find those fellas walking in there against Gomez since in the first inning outside of Bartell's drive over third base they looked a little bit weak at the plate. Evidently uh, Gomez is not treating them with the same respect that Hubble is treating the Yankee hitters. He's simply firing that ball in and trusting that those nine men in back of them or eight men I should say in back of them and certainly so far they've done a swell job. Two of those catches out there in the outfield were better than ordinary catches, particularly Selkirk's on the last one. Well, here's your first Yankee hitter, Tom. That'll be Merle Holt. 
Last half of the second inning, no score as yet. Merle Hogue is 29 years old. Comes from out Sacramento, California. This season, batting 301. Merle has always been a fine baseball player, but unfortunately he's been out of the regular lineup on many occasions because the Yankees have always had so much superior outfield. Southpaw, Gus Mancuso catching. Last half of the second inning, no score, and Hogan, the hitter. Strike call. Earl Hogan stuck his bat out, threw third baseman Mel out in, but of course had no intention of running that ball, just by way of drawing Mel out in from third base. Ball, low and outside, and the count on Hogan is ball one and strike one. Earl Hogan, the batter. Georgie Selker. George has been on the injured and sick list quite a bit during the last half of the season, but he's back in there now, strong as ever. Ball one, strike one. Bounding ball down, third goes foul. Hardy Fletcher tried to stop it, got past him, but Ballot retrieved the ball, and then the Giants whip it around the infield. It takes Bartell to Whitehead to McCarthy, and finally back to Hump. Hit that ball, started to run, was three quarters of the way down to first base, walking back rather slow. Strike two and ball one. Kyle Hubble winding up. Too high. Over the plate, a little bit high on the count as ball two and strike two. Well, NBC Mike is right over home plate. We're pretty high, but right in line with the pitcher and catcher. Pretty fair seat, in other words. Ball two, strike two. Pounding ball down short. Burgess comes up with it. The throw. He's out. Out by plenty. Put out. Six to three for those who keep the score. Yes, Sir Warren Brown just gives me a note that that was the first assist of the ball game. Right you are, Warren. Strikeout, two fly balls. Two flies to center field by Gary Gazicki and a strikeout by Ross. Now we have Georgie Selkirk, the right fielder, left-hand batter coming up. George hit 328 this year. George is 29 years old. Hits the first ball, a high hopper. Down second base, Whitehead to McCarthy, and Selkirk is out. Last half of the second inning with no score as yet. Two men have been retired, and... Boots him up, Tony Nazario, and listen to the applause he gets. Tony Nazario, always been a gentleman, fine, great ball player. They like him a lot here in New York, and they should. Tony bats him right hand. Ball one outside. Tony is 33 years old. This year, Tony has hit quite as well as usual, batting around 250. Ball one is the count, two out, nobody on. Strike call. Hubble had a nice fast ball over the inside corner with Lazari pulling away. Well, he gets a handful of dirt there, drying his hands off. And the count will be ball one and strike one. Last half of the second inning, no score is yet, two out, nobody out. There's the, the hot strike back to Hubble. He knocked it down, picks it up, crosses to McCarthy, and Missouri is out. That ball was hit right smack on the nose, and the applause is for that stop of Kyle Hubble. No run, no hit, no errors, no score at the conclusion of two innings. Four. Well, my darling, Tom, we brought up that matter of the no assist in that inning since there was nothing else from there on. But it was an oddity that we got into as far as the last half of the second inning without having one of the infielders handle the, the ball on the ground and have to throw to first base. Uh, it seems to me now that the game has definitely settled down into a warfare between the pitchers, which, of course, lives up to all the specifications of the experts going into the series. They recognize that Gomez was the superior pitcher in his league, and there is no doubt in anybody's mind about Carl Hubble's place in the National League. And so far, there hasn't been very much of anything between the two of them. It's been strictly a pitcher's battle so far, and now we have to sit around here for a while and just 
wait and see what the break is going to be. And in this sort of a ball game, one never knows when it might pop out. All right, Tom. We're going into the first half of the third inning. In the National League, Jeffrey, the Giants coming to bat. And their second baseman, Purchase Whitehead. Purchase, 26 years old this year. He hit 286. But De Gomez winds up. Ball one. Burning fast ball over the plate for two low. One hit apiece so far. There's a bounding ball through the box. A close stop by Cosetti to throw. He's out. A beautiful play by Frankie Cosetti. That was a pounding ball just out of the reach of Rusty Gomez. Frankie Cosetti was off with a crack of the bat, took that ball right over the second base cushion, right on the air, flipped it over to Ruth Gehrig for the foot out. The applause is for Paul Hubble. Listen to it. Paul Hubble, you know, pitches left-handed and bats him right-handed. One out, nobody on. A foul upstairs. Well, there wasn't much of a scramble for that ball. It was hopped right into the waiting hands of a gentleman who I do not believe is going to toss it back. Here we go. Ball inside. Sharp breaking hook ball. Just a little bit close. And the count is ball one and strike one on Carl Hubble. Inside and it's ball two. Let's see Gomez had plenty on that one. Getting quite dark here at Yankee Stadium in New York. Decided advantage, I'd say, for Lefty Gomez. Fireball pitch. There's a long drag going out to right field filter going back and near the wall and makes the catch. That ball was hit exactly 340 feet from home plate. So Kurt taking that ball just about four feet in front of the barrier out in deep right field. Mr. Hubble tags that ball very, very well. a base hit in an awful lot of ballparks, but not here in Spacey's Yankee Stadium. Two out. First half of the third inning, no score as yet. What's more at the top of the batting order coming up? It's Joe Moore. Last time up, he was out. Gary Gunnison. A strike. Call. Lefty Gomez pitching. And Bill Dickey to catch it. Coming. Another shot breaking through ball is outside. Direction ball one, strike one. One and one. Ball two. Back ball. Over the plate, but just a little bit low. And it's ball two and strike one. Let me drop that one was good enough. Here's the wind up. Ball two and strike one. Foul back. Count is two and two. Joe Moore coming up for the second time. Lead off man of the Giants the first time up. He was out. Gary Gunnison. After the up toss that ball to Dickey, the Yankees whipped it around the infield. Happy Gomez taking his glove off. Nice putting it back on in the box. And here we go. Ball two, strike two. Right back to Gomez, a similar play has ended the Yankee time at bat. A hard smash through the box to Dutty Gomez, grabs his glove hand, tossed over the first for the foot out. No runs, no hits, no errors. Mr. Brown. All right, Mr. Manning. The uh, surprising thing, I think, of these last two innings, as far as the Yankees are concerned, is their presentation in a new light. Here to four, all of us that have been writing and talking about the Yankees have been mentioning their power at the plate. These last two innings have shown them to be a very snappy defensive ball club. Every one of those plays in the last inning and every one of the plays in the second inning was a very deftly handled ball, by whether it was outfielders or infielders. That play that Frank Rossetti made down in second base there was, I think, the most... Uh, spectacular one so far. The outfield has certainly performed up to a standard that we didn't expect since we regarded them strictly as hitters. All right, Tom. A round of applause that's seeping through your loudspeaker now is for El Duby Gomez, who's pitching this afternoon for the Yankees. Now, Lefty doesn't get very many pace hits during the regular season. When he gets one, it's always the most colorful picture. 
comes to happen this afternoon and try and watch his every move and transmit it to you. Last half of the third inning, we have no scores yet. The Yanks coming to bat. And the pitcher, Lefty Gomez, who bats him and throws him left hand. Hubble. Bounding ball down to Whitehead. An easy chance to play to McCarthy and Gomez is up. a feeble swing that Lefty took at that ball. Nice, easy hopper that Burgess Whitehead took knee high and tossed it over to Johnny McCarthy for the out. Again, the top of the Yankee batting order coming up. Frankie Cosetti, one of the three Italian boys that play on the Yankee team. And Cuso and Chiosa, the Italian boys in the Giant team. Last time up, Cosetti drew a face on ball. The pitch ball one, it's low outside. First game of the World Series. Boys will play four out of seven. Two here at Yankee Stadium, and then we move over to the Polo Ground. There we go. Strike call. Now had a fastball in there, right over the heart of the plate, felt high. A call strike, and the count is four one and strike one. Last half of the third inning. Yankees batting, one out, nobody on. There it is. Ball two. That was over the plate. A little bit too low. And the count is ball two and the strike one. Red Rolf, third baseman. The next. Frankie Grosetti, right hand batter is up. Ball two and strike one. It is inside ball three. Frankie Grosetti is a tough little boy to pitch to. Wiggling up there, giving the pitcher no target to shoot at. One out, nobody on. Hubble lines up at ball three and strike one. It's in there, a cold strike. Well, has that one in there, fell high and right over the heart of the plate. Frank Rosetti elected to work out the string, and the count is ball three and strike two. Well, the two trips 
to the plate. Rossetti threw a base on balls and fly to Gilmore in left field. Red Roth up. Last time up, he struck out. Throughout, nobody on. Hubble lines up. It's a ball. Sweeping curve ball, not too fast. Missed the outside corner, and the count on Roth is ball one. Not quite as dark here now as it was while the Giants were at bat. No sunshine or anything like that, but brightening up a little bit. Cut that one down left field with a scurving foul into the stands, and the count is ball one and strike one. Red Wolf is back in the batter's box. Again, Carl Hubble has a new ball. That's the cleanest looking ball that we've seen out there this afternoon. Ball one and strike one, two out. And nobody on. Fly ball going out to left field. Joey coming over to the line under it. He takes it, and that's all for the Yankees in the third inning. No runs, no hits, no errors. One. There's no reason to suspect, Tom, that uh, these pitchers aren't still in complete control of the ball game. Hubble has been almost perfect, I might say, since the first inning. Outside of uh, Frank Rossetti, who hit a ball rather sharply into left field, and Rolf, who just hit a dinky fly out to Joe Moore, none of the others have been able to get the ball past the infield. Hubble seems to have recovered whatever lack of control it was that he started out at in the game. He's getting that ball just about where he wants it. And with these two clubs having a pretty good understanding of such weaknesses, if weaknesses exist in the other side's offensive array, why well, I think Carl will go along pretty well. He seems to be perfectly self-contained, whereas Gomez, on the other hand, is just as effective and seems to be perfectly content with the way things are going on. I don't know if that I blame it. All right, Tom. Yeah. All right, we're going into the first half of the fourth inning. We ought to get a bit of excitement now. On both sides, we have Bartel, Ott, Lieber coming up for the Giants, and in the fourth inning, all the Yankees will have coming up will be DiMaggio, Gary, and Dixon. Group coaching at first and Slider at third for the Giants. Here we go. Bartell up. Gets the first ball. Fits to the mighty drive going deep. Oh, going back on the cylinder track, and he has it. Run out. Nick Bartell, as I told you in the first inning, is a long left field hitter. He got a hold of that first ball. Pitched. It was a high ball. A better high. Stepped into it. Drove it deep. Out into left field with Holt, who was playing deep, running back to the center track and making the catch. Now we have Melvin Ott coming up. Now he's 28 years old. He got it 294 this year. Last time up. He flies the first baseman, Lou Gary. The first pitch, ball one. Sharp breaking curve ball with a slow outside to a left hand hitter. Ball two. Ball right under Bell's chin. Stepped away from the plate. Now the count is two and nothing. First half of the fourth inning. There's a bounding ball through the box. As Ellie goes over, makes the play. It's close. He's out. Boy, what a play that was by Ellie Lizelli. That was a bounding ball over the head. All Lefty Gomez, Ellie Lizelli, running away from first base. Grabbed that ball to his right. Then leap pivoted, shot the ball over to Luke Gehrig, just ahead of Mellot. Only by about one step. Two outs, nobody on. Beautiful play by Tony, the best play of the game so far. Hank Lieber is up. Right hand hitter, strike, he swings and misses. Two very beautiful infield plays there, one by Closetti and this one by Tony Mazzelli. Strike one, Lieber hitting. Makes a mighty cut of that sharp breaking third ball, swung over it, and it's strike two. The high infield fly ball and back of second base, Mazzelli, the gel for it, under it, he has it. That's all for the Giants in the fourth inning, no runs, no hits, no errors, one. All right, Tom, the uh, thing that I've been waiting for since this World Series game began just appeared out there now. We've heard Shell throughout the summer that 
Maybe Tony Lazari, the veteran of many a campaign up here with the Yankees, was slowing down a little bit. Well, he certainly gave no evidence in that play that he made out there in this last inning. When he ranged over back at second base and came up with a ball. The fact that he got in front of the ball was not so much a part of the play as his ability to throw while definitely out of position. He was getting rid of that ball almost while he was running straight away from where he had to throw it. And the two uh, activities combined give Tony at the present time the lead for the spectacular feeling in this series. All right, Tom, here's Joe DiMaggio now. All right, the big guns of the Yankees. One of the big reasons why the Yankees are so far out in front in the American League. DiMaggio, Jerry, and Dickinson. Giant outfield playing way back. Standing clear out the other side of the track, standing out there about 360 feet from home plate, waiting for DiMaggio to hit. Here we go, Hubble pitching. Ball one. Sharp breaking curveball. On a foot outside. Must be the Joe Moore playing right on the track. He's approximately 380 feet from home plate. Certainly play Joe DiMaggio deep. And they should. The pounding ball between first and second. Play hit coming over. The throw, he's out. Joe hit that ball right on the tip of his bat. And it was a sizzling little grounder down between first and second. Looked for a moment. If he had a chance to beat it out, the play hit as fast. Came over, scooped the ball up. Got it to Johnny McCarthy at first. And DiMaggio is out. Lou Gary got it. Last time up, Lou Gary got a hold of the ball, but he hoisted it much too high. Giving center fielder Hank Weaver a chance to get under it for the put off. Giant pitcher, Kyle Hubble. Wiping the perspiration from his trowel. Now he's ready to go. Gary the hitter, left hand batter. Up. Strike call. Boy, Killer Hubble should have had a lot on that one. Ball he's crossed all afternoon, right over the heart of the plate. There it is. Outside. Ball one, strike one. Oh, well, your heart sort of begins to beat. Double quick time when this baby Gary stepped up to that plate. What a picture. Big broad shoulders and big strong arms. One and one. Foul. Oh. Clear over the stands, over the back of first base. It's quite a hoist to get it over the stands here at Yankee Stadium. It was rejected, you know. Strike two, ball one. The Yanks batting in the fourth inning, and it's quite a ball game. A pitcher's battle so far, each side having one base hit. DiMaggio getting a hit for the Yanks, and Bartell for the Giants. Strike two and ball one. Inside, driving Gehrig away from the plate, and the count is ball two and strike two. Catcher Bill Dickey hanging around home plate. He'll be next. Martell is playing over almost in back of second base. Whitehead has shifted over between first and second. McCarthy playing two yards from the line. Here we go. Gehrig swung in a bad ball, just a funny, and it's a strikeout. Dugout, and Bill Carey is down there, sort of out in front of his players. 
and to distinguish him from the rest of them, he has a towel around his neck. I've been trying to figure out for several innings why that was, but I gathered he was waving his outfielders around, particularly his center fielder, Hank Lieber. He was steering him around with the aid of his arm and the towel, and I can see now that the, the distance of these giant outfielders play away from the plate and naturally away from their own dugout with Gehrig at the plate. It's no wonder that Bill needs a towel around his neck. From that distance, one giant looks the same as another. This is the first time that I've noticed Terry taking that active part in the direction of his outfielders during the progress of play, but it was quite interesting to me. All right, Tom, here comes the next one. Now we're going into the first half of the fifth inning. The fans are beginning to group in unison. This time it happens to be for the Giants. I thought Carl Hubble was getting a little better as he moves along. What's your opinion about it? Well, he broke off at Gehrig. I think Tom was the finest breaking curve that was thrown by either one of these pitchers this afternoon. At least that was the way it looked to me. It didn't start out as a bad pitch, but it broke so sharply that it made Gehrig look bad. Didn't you think so? Yes, sir. Well, here we go. Give me Ripple. Right fielder, first man up. Ball one. Her ball was outside. Last time up, Ripple flies to left field. Selkirk has moved back over the center track. Joe DiMaggio has moved over right center field. Strike. Call. Ball one, strike one. Let's see Gomez pitching. Drive down the left is foul. Roar goes up from the crowd there. They... Some of the fans were on a different, different angle than we are. Takes a little longer to see whether that ball is curving tall or not. All right, it's strike two and ball one. First half of the fifth inning, no score as yet. Each of the teams, the Giants and Yanks, have made one hit. Ball two, a fast ball that knocked Jimmy Ripple down. That's the first ball of the product that was knocked down this afternoon, getting out of the way of the ball. Two and strike two. Lefty Gomez pitching, Bill Dickey catching. Two and two, the foul back, and the count remains two and two. Ripple got a piece of a good curveball from Gomez that time. Well fixed ball, it was striking over the outside corner. No fire caught down a new ball. Gave it a Dickey. Dickey shot it down the rope. Rolf got some dirt and rubbed it up, and now Ormsby has asked for the ball again. Crosses out another ball. He's telling Bill Dickey now to stop throwing that ball in the dirt. Just a little fly play by the boys. Nothing serious. Yanks threw that ball around the infield. Now Gomez has it. We're ready to go again. Jimmy Ripple, the hitter. There's a face mark in the right field of line five. Lands out there. Seltzer has it, and so is the second ripple stopping at first. Second giant hit of the afternoon. That down two and two. Hefty Gomez came in there with a straight ball inside. Ripple pulled away and pulled the ball with it to right field for a base stop. Johnny McCarthy coming up, the first baseman. Tall boy, Batson throws left-handed. Last time up, fly to Mazzari. The first pitch, plenty wide of the plate. A beautiful stop by Bill Dickey. Ball one. It was a third ball that started to break over the outside corner. By the time it was finished, it was on the outside of the right-handed batter box. Here it comes. Ball two. Again, it's outside. yelling that there are a lot of giant fans here in Yankee Stadium this afternoon.
hard ground ball that Maselli came over. He was able to touch that ball, but unable to hold it. The ball rolled on out to right field. This is the first scoring cut of the afternoon. The Giants have runners on first and third. Nobody out. And Gus Van Cusel coming up. The picture again, McCarthy is on first. Griffith is on third base. Gomez pitching. Van Cusel up. That was a pitch out. And saw Ripple was too far off third base. Perhaps the Yankees were expecting a squeeze play or something that time. Anyway, Dickey wanted to find out, and inside baseball, he called for a pitch out. Here it is. The ball upstairs. Strike. Ball one, and strike one. Gus Van Cusel, the, gi- the giant catcher, is a right hand batter. Last time up, he flies to right field. First half of the fifth inning. No score as yet. And the Giants have runners on first and third. Ripple on third, McCarthy on first. Ball one, strike one. Here it is. Strike two. A beautifully pitched ball. Right under the hand with the bat. Over the inside corner. With Van Cuso taking a terrific cut. It's strike two and ball one. Johnny McCarthy staying pretty close to first base. Luke Gary holding him on there. Here it is. Right field going foul. It is. It's foul in the stands, and the count remains two and one. Thank you, sir. Reaching outside for that pick. The Yankees have crossed that ball around the infield. Not very rapidly, but each one of them feeling the ball. The Yankee infield is playing back. Going well, to give up that run on third base, apparently. Here's the pick. Another foul. Was upstairs. Upstairs and back at first base. Gus Van Cusel, the batter at strike two and ball one. Let's take a look at that picture for you. Second base combination. Cosetti and Rosario playing pretty deep. Ed Roll is playing deep enough. Gehrig is right in the bag holding McCarthy there. Gomez tosses over to Gehrig. Go to have Harden. Just letting McCarthy know that he's in there. Strike two and ball one. Van Cusel up. Gomez stretches. Here it is. The ground ball down at Rosetti. Rosetti to Rosari. Out at second. Out at first. The double play. And Ripple crosses the plate. And he got that with Ripple on third base. McCarthy on first. Van Cusel hits a ground ball to Rosetti. Rosetti picked it up. Crossed to Rosari. Getting McCarthy. Rosari to Gary. Getting Van Cusel. A double play. And the score. The Giants won. The Yankees nothing. Burgess Whitehead coming up. The Giants second base, the right-hand batter. Last time up, he was out short to first. The pitch right down the alley, a cold strike. Empty goal, as you know. The fans throughout the circuit haven't appreciated the fireball that he possesses, but he's got a lot of it. Outside, and it's a ball. Ball one and strike one. Many of the ball players have said that Gomez has a ball. He throws just quickly as fast as Bob Feller or Lefty Bob throws. Ball one and strike one. There's a long smash to right field. It's foul by two yards down the right field corner. Again, the fans jump to their feet on that line smash by Burgess Whitehead. Warren, I believe we've had more shots down the foul lines in this particular game than any game we've seen in a long time. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, don't they come? <laughs> Ready to go again. Gomez has the glove off for a moment. And the count is strike two and ball one. First half of the fifth inning. The Giants batting two out, nobody on. The windup. There's a face knock over Gary's head down to the right field corner. Ball carries off the wall. He's going to second. There's the ball. He goes through the second standing up. And the first extra base hit of the World Series in 1937. And the third giant hit of this inning. First half of the fifth. Now we have Carl Hubble, the giant pitcher, coming up. It was a mighty wallop by Burgess Whitehead. A line drive that was about 15 feet over the head of first base for Luke Gehrig, and the ball going down into the right field corner. Hit the barrier down there, 296 feet from home plate, and fouled it out to Georgie Selkirk, but it was ample time for Whitehead to reach second base standing up. The fourth hit of the ball game, the third hit of the first half of the fifth inning for the National League Giants. Here's the pitch to Hubble. He hits the first ball. You tell me about that drive. Right. That one just missed, and it looked like a cinch hit. And then when it started to come, that's been going on all afternoon. 
right down those foul lines on both sides of the field. <laughs> well, it was so good that Carl Hubble was all the way down to first on his way to second anyway. One thing I don't like about radio announcers is to kid you out, you know, and make you believe that there's no chance of a base hit when there isn't. Going again. Has a bounding ball to Gary. Gary comes up with it. Steps on the bag for the put out. On a system. That's all for the Giants in the fifth inning. One run, three hits, and no error. We've completed four and a half innings of this first game of the Blue Ribbon Classic. This is Carl Manning speaking. I've enjoyed it thoroughly working with you, Warren, and broadcasting for you, the radio audience. And the remaining part of the ball game will be broadcast by Red Barber of Cincinnati, Ohio. But before Red comes in, Warren Brown. All right, Tom. Drive through him in the fifth inning. Most important 
base hit of the afternoon. So that that ripple around the third. Barry in a crowd, looking at six sharply. Right hand batter, wings and fouls it into the dirt. Justin and Cusco retrieve, strike one. We have both pitches left handers today, and both of them flirting with Lady Luck as both are wearing 11. However, the dame cannot smile both ways at the same time. Hubble has never lost an opening World Series game, and Gomez has never lost a World Series game. So somebody is going to get hurt before this day is over. Hubble pitching to Lazari. All strike two. He picks up the inside corner just under the ladder. Right over the short rim. Nothing in two. Two out. Nobody on. Last of the fifth inning. The Giants ahead one to nothing. Now field sharp at one left. Playing Lazari is an out and out full hitter. The pitch is into the dirt in front of the plate. Four one. The first time the Pablo has thrown anything that looked wildly. However, that's not a wild pitch. A wild pitch is only so scored when there's a runner on base to advance and take advantage of it. Just four one. One and two. Pablo has retired the last 13 Yankees in a row. Given up just one hit, one base on ball, so that's coming in the first inning. First third of the first inning. Swinging stretch, delivers outside a curve that did not come down and in to a right hand hitter thrown by left hander. Two and two. Down at shortstop, couple box, Dick Bartell, visiting with the uniform, putting his cap down. Melon, the reform right fielder who's done a great job at third base, moves a little dirt, moves out of terrain around him. He's put over pretty close to the foul line. Whitehead is over almost back to second base. There's a 2 2 pitch. Swung on and missed for strike three. That's the third strikeout for Carl Hubble. And for the first time, pitching with a one run lead, he makes it look just that much better. Bob is now retired the last 14 men in a row. We pause for our station identification. Stadium and in the NBC booth at the top of the stand looking over the World Series. And the strong point about Hubble now, since uh, Red has told you how he's been mowing everybody down since the first inning, is that in these latter states, it seems to me he's making the Yankees hit at bad ball. That last pitch on which Tony Lazari struck out wasn't a very good pitch, but he lashed at it rather wildly. That would indicate to me that Hubble has the boys on the hip, and nothing but a break is going to beat him so far, but we'll see. All right, then. Thank you, Warren. It's the top of the giant batting order up in the sixth inning. Joe Moore coming up for his third time, and he so far hasn't gotten the ball out the infield. Hitting left-handed, he takes outside, just missing by a hair for ball one. Joe first up in this ball game, rounded out to Gehrig unassisted, then hit back to Gomez in the third inning. The pitch, strike one call. One and one. Joe Moore standing deep in batter's box and goes over to catch a Bill Dickey, who remains down in his crowd, now straightens up, sets his minute to target. Swung on and fouled into the upper deck of the stands and back of third base. Going for a high outside pitch. So it didn't pull it enough, and it's one and two. First man up in the sixth inning. Gomez pitching behind now as the Giants leading one to nothing. The outfield is toward right. Moore swings, hits it right back through the middle, safely through into the center field. A ground single, back past the mound, over second, out into the center field for a hit number five for the Giants and hit number six of this first game of the 1937 World Series. Joe Moore singles right through the middle. And with nobody out from New York, top of the sixth, the Giants already ahead, one to nothing. Moore leads down off first. Gehrig has to hold the inside corner, and Dick Bartell, who got the first hit of the series, had one to do us up. Takes inside, throws against him, ball one. Gomez coming down with a fan ball, just under the waist, on the inside. Bartell stands, turns toward right field, but when he steps in on the pitch, he throws for short. Gomez delivers, Bartell swinging, hits a high fly ball into right field. Zirkert waiting in the middle of the track for it, and has it. Halfway down to second, Joe Moore chimes at the catch and retreat back to third base. One out, top of the sixth. Stepping up is Melvin Ott, who was a New York Giant, 
regular at the age of 17 as he's been ever since. Scott stands just as close to catch a dick as he can get. Out here toward right. Mel swings and misses as he took his cut. One that came down under the shoulder on the inside. Dan hit her up against a left-handed pitcher. Gomez drives up the left hand, rubbing it across his shirt. Takes the sign hurriedly, sets in pitcher position, throws out of the shoulder. Fastball wide, and it's one and one. One away. Joe Moore, very fleet. Knows his way around those bases, beating down off first. Talking Luke Gehrig, the endurance player of all baseball, both the corner against him. Luke, a coaching back of first. This on is strike two call. A neat sharp hook down just above the knee. You see these fastballs thrown by Gomez, and then you look at him, slender. Willowy sending himself into a press with Big Ace when he throws and you wonder where he gets the strike. Hot swinging, it's a high foul. Up and back into the upper deck. The Yankee Stadium has the ground floor, the first level, then a mezzanine, and then a still higher upper deck. So it's three floors of spectators. Not quite a sellout. A few hundred seats are left. A field court right on hot. Swings back from one under the chin. Count levels off at two and two. One away. Here in the top of the sixth. Gomez looks out for the scoreboard to check himself. Not waiting. Two-two pitch is swung on, lifted high and foul. Dickey coming back underneath it, over by the giant dugout, and makes the catch. One step out in front of the giant bat. Resting in their box right in front of New York's dugout. Two away in the top of the sixth. Joe Moore, who opened up with a single through the middle, is still at first base. Hank Lieber, who's been given chance after chance by Bill Jerry, who's received another strong vote of confidence from Boss Bill by starting him in this first of the 1937 Fall Classic games, is now coming up for his third time. Lieber was struck out by Gomez to end the first inning. And he popped up to second base. In the fourth to his area. Now he's up for his third trip over to the outfield deep or out to left. Swinging, fouled it straight back onto the screen. Strike one. Hank, big, blonde. When you look at him, nobody has to tell you that he was one time a fullback. He's built that way. Right hand hitter who cocktails that war club and swings from his heels on up and out. Throw away and Joe Moore entered going anything, leading down off first. 270 feet away. Lever steps back out of the box. Bergen Gomez taking too much time. Lifted, very, very nervous. The perfect entrance is a trouble, even though they're both left-handed. Delivers outside. One and one. That ball sticking down. Wasn't quite even close. Lever steps back out of the box. Picks up a little dirt in his right hand. Now sets. He stands right up against the plate. Feet wide spread. That cock way back. Fell over his right shoulder. He swings and it's a long belt. Hold back on it and takes it. That's all for the top of the sixth inning. And the Yankees coming in for the last of the sixth. The Giants lead one to nothing. As calm Carl Hubble starts pacing out toward the mound. And into the mic, Warren Brown. All right, Red. I was going to uh, pay particular attention to that last half inning because it was the one in which Gomez had to pitch after he was roughhoused a little bit just before that. And when Joe Moore, another left-hand hitter, led off with that single to the infield and out in the center field, I began to wonder whether Gomez was losing his stuff or not. However, Lefty is still out there battling him because he recovered, and while the Giants have one run off him, they certainly haven't distinguished themselves any more than the Yankees themselves have against the pitching of Carl Hubble. Gomez is still the effective pitcher and a great pitcher, and there's been nothing happened in this game to disprove that. As uh, he goes through his work out there, as Red told you, he seems to be a little more busy than uh, Hubble is. Hubble is certainly a very calm sort of a person, and playing behind that one-run lead, he has the advantage. All right, Red. The applause greets the appearance of Lefty Gomez as he steps up to hit against Hubble, first up in the last of the sixth inning. Hubble out there pitching to protect his one-to-nothing advantage. Gomez hitting left-handed. Thrown out. 
Whitehead to McCarthy. He's other time up. He ducks, hits the dirt as one comes right in at the point of his shoulder. Ball one. Well, that certainly wouldn't be the accolade that one pitcher gives another. But at any rate, it was a warm salutation. As the boys say, uh, Gomez was low bridge. He had to pull his ears in in a hurry in order to keep them both. Up now, drying off his hands, rubbing the dirt off of them. Van Cuso doesn't look at all sympathetic. Squatting down in his crouch now stands up. Gomez dries off his hands. He couldn't get them quite dry rubbing along his uniform, and one of the giants threw them the giant batter's rosin bag, and he used it and then tossed it back. Ball one, of course. Out there a little toward left. Up the cheeks. High inside. Ball two. Thank you, so turns over that ball. Umpire Ormsby, who examines it, takes it out of play, and another one's put in. Turns straight back to Hubble. Two nothing to Gomez. First up. Last of the sixth inning. The Giants lead the Yankees one to nothing. Got that run. Top of the fifth. Hubble the time the last 14 Yankees in a row. Delivers 2 nothing. Inside and high for ball three. Hub is behind on his control now for the first time since he walked for Zanny. First up against him in the ball game. Earl Combs coaching back of third. Uh, coaching back of first. Fletcher back of third. Both of them setting out a hoop for Hala. Gomez calling the play from behind. Ahead 3 nothing. Hub comes in. And gets it. The automatic strike. Three and one. Just above the knees. Melot playing up close by third. Up tries three one. And registers. Strike two call. Up behind three nothing. Has thrown his last two pitches right through there. Picked up his cap for a moment. Wiped the perspiration off of his forehead. It's a hot and muggy steaming sort of an afternoon, so he was sitting in the upper deck of a double ball. Up ready for the 3-2 pitch, aims it, it swung on and foul tip back. The first time the Gomez has offered it one. Up this time, first and the last of the sixth. You ball put in the way, by way of third baseman Ott. Coming it up, he walks calmly over toward the mound. There are two rather cool customers, Ott at third. Up along the mound. Another cool one is Mancuso under that bat. Right side of the infield, talking it up between them. Harvey and Whitehead. A hub, an easy swinging stretch. He doesn't wind up. Delivers. Low end sign for ball four. Hubble has given up two walks. Gomez hasn't walked anyone. And both times, Hubble has walked the Yankee. He has dabbed the old baseball axiom that the walk, the first batter up in the inning, is fatal. That's Hubble by passing Gomez, his opposing pitcher, first up from the last of the six. Puts the potential tie going on first with nobody else. Now let's see how the Yankees go about trying to get back this one run. One run through the season hasn't meant anything at all to the Yankees. But one run against Hubble in a short series such as the World Series can mean a lot. But after all, when the ball game's over, one run's a whole lot if you haven't got it. Gomez leading down off first, not very far. Carthus travels the corner against him. Frank Cosetti, the lead offers up there. He's been on once with a walk. First inning. Outfield is pulled around toward left. His right hand hitter. There's a throw down to first out of time. This goes high outside for ball one. Gomez ran down off first a little bit. And when Mancuso took that outside pitch and threw to first, it was cut off by McCarthy, who had run in anticipating a bunt on the part of Cosetti. Even if Gomez had been a long way off first, which he was, there was nobody at first base to tag him. Hot pulled up, stepped back to the grass at third. Whitehead pulled up on the baseline at second. There's an attempted bunt, which is fouled back onto the screen. One and one. Frank Rossetti, with a high, piercing voice, can be heard from short, regardless of the size of the crowd. Up there, hitting right-handed. Counts one and one. Mancuso. Calls for time, walks out to the mound, talking to Hubble. And now both men of the giant battery have their caps off, and both are rubbing the beads of perspiration off of their faces. And Cuso, with a great big handkerchief, now he stuffed it back in his pocket. Comes stumping stoutedly, back of the plate, 
swarthy little Gus Mancuso. There's been a lot more to the giant pitching than most people realize the last few years. Defense pulled up on the infield. Outfields, usual depth and around foot left. Rossetti up to count one and one, nobody out. Gomez off first. Up pitches. There's another attempted at and it's foul back. Strike two. Ups come right in with these last two pitches. Rossetti has not been able to lay them down. One and two. Nobody out. On deck to hit after Rossetti. He's wrong. Ups naturally going to be trying to throw a double play ball right now. There's been one double play in the ball game. That was hit in two by Mancuso as he got credit for batting in the one run so far of the struggle in the fifth inning. The run is on first and third. Scored one to nothing. The Giants. Ball game here at Yankee Stadium. Sort of a cloudy, smoky afternoon. Cusetti waiting now behind one and two. Hot pitches. Cusetti swings. At the line. Brian hit on the left. There's a base hit. Joe Moore takes it on the first bounce. Gomez holds at second. A sharp single for Cusetti into left field. A long single. And I imagine the Giants wish now that Cresetti hadn't fouled off those two pitches when he was trying to bunt. Hubble, after getting 14 straight Yankees, walked Gomez. The second pass he's given up. Walked Gomez, first up in the last of this sixth inning. And Cresetti, after vainly trying twice to sacrifice... Swung on a 1-2 pitch and hit a clean line drive single to left. That's the second hit off Hubble. And now the tying run is at second and nobody is out and the batter is red Roth. The giant defense is pulled in after the second. This is going to be a butt. Roth takes high outside. Mancuso throws to second and Gomez is safe as the ball gets away from Bartel. Mancuso has Gomez picked off second base. But his throw gets away from shortstop Bartel. And Gomez slides back in and is safe. He was absolutely caught off off second base. A pitch out coming down to Roth. Outside for ball one. And Cuso throwing to the third base corner of second. And Gomez cleanly caught off. And it is an error on the play for Bartel. The first error of the series. Bartel letting Mancuso throw get away when Gomez was put cleanly off second. An error for Bartel. And Gomez remains at second base. Roth, a left hand hitter, standing close to him, back of the plate. Hug pitches. Roth takes high outside. Mancuso threatens to throw down to second, but this time Gomez is glued to the bag. He learned his lesson the easy way just now. Excitement here in the last of the sixth as the Yankees are threatening to rise into their muchly vaunted power and strength. Rough up, Dimaggio on deck. Up pitches inside for ball three. And Rough at the head. Hubble is behind with his control. This New York crowd at the moment seems to be a Yankee crowd. Judging from the way they are applauding these balls that Hubble is missing the plate with to Red Rock, the Yankee third baseman. Nobody out lands at the sixth. Presetti is at first. Gomez is at second. Roth up there. Three nothing. Up comes in, and Roth takes strike one call. Roth up there, wiggling and dancing. But there's a barefooted dancer on the sand of the Sahara at high noon, trying to disconcert Hub and make him miss his target. Hubble in the pitching position. Going out of the shoulder. There's a bunt foul. Back now to third. 3-1 pitch. It was attempted bunt. It was fouled off. Now it's three and two. Hub walks around back of that mound. So this is just batting practice. I think that's one of his greatest assets. The man is never unnerved. I think the way Hubble pitches, especially in times of stress in baseball, is a good lesson for most of us in the everyday world. He just very quietly keeps his chin out and keeps going as best he knows how. Three and two, runners lead off first and second. Swung on, fouled, right over into the Yankee dugout. Still three and two. The pace is rather slow. The Giants 
become thinkers. In a clutch, they figure out everything they're going to do, and they're certain that everybody on the ball club knows exactly what the defensive move will be. Up drawing off that left hand of his, throws away the rod and bag, steps up onto the rubber, shrugs his shoulders, takes a look at those runners, now looks down, takes the sign from Mancuso, who's staying in his crouch. Roth crouching, left hand hitter over the plate. Up pitches. There's a high foul coming up and back. Mancuso coming back, back, cannot get it. It lands just back on the screen. Still three and two. Still the old blood pressure keeps pounding away up there at, at a baseball high for excitement. The Giants drew first blood this afternoon. The only blood so far that's been left. They got a run in the fifth inning. They're leading by that margin, one to nothing. However, here in the last two sixth, a walk, a single, and then an error allows Yankees to be at first and second and nobody off. The three-two count is to Red Roth. Up looks around, Gomez leads off second. Pizzetti comes down off first. Up pitcher three-two. They stuff it out into left center field. It's a hit. Gomez holds up at third base and the bases are loaded. A single to left center field. And the bases are full and nobody off. In the last of the six, and now the Dynamiters, DiMaggio, Garrick, and Dickey is the program. <laughs> Down in the giant bullpen, one of the relief pitchers is being warmed up, but he is completely hidden from view. So we can't tell you who it is. You cannot see in either team's bullpen here at the stadium the potential relief pitchers as they groom themselves to get ready. A single into left center field by Roth. Advance to Freddy to second base and Gomez to third. They both had to hold to see whether Joe Moore could come in and make the catch, which he took. Now the base is loaded, nobody out. Last of the sixth inning. Joe DiMaggio, jolting Joe is up there, right hand hitter, feet wide spread. He spread eagle right through the middle of batter's box. Gomez leading off third, Gazzetti off second. Off down off first. The defense is deep around toward left. Up delivers. It's swung on, it's a base hit. In comes Gomez, Gazzetti around third, is heading for the plate. Two runs are in, and runners are on first and second.
bases are loaded with nobody out in the last of the sixth. Bill Dickey is up there. Bad Bill, as the Yankees call him right now. He'll be Sweet William if he delivers. The infield is full up on the base pass. The left-hand hitter is Dickey. Hubble pitching. Low outside for ball one. The Yankees have caught and passed the Giants, and they're threatening to do still more here in the last of the sixth of this first game. The Giant enter defense right up on the base pass. Bases jam. Runners at all three points. Dickey waiting. Takes low for ball two. One just under the knees. Ball two. Two to one. The Yankees in this Edis City Series. Hubble, one of the toughest spots of his life. It's a sweltering hot afternoon. Cloudy. Hutton has extra heat applied to him right now at the moment, aside from the weather. Dickey waiting. He's ahead. 2 nothing pitch. Swung on. as a ground ball. The bases remain full and the run scores. Two more runs come in. And Selkirk 
Clark single. Drives in two runs to put the Yankees ahead five to one and sends Polk around to third base. A single to right by Selkirk. Hits sharply through the hole between first and second. And the Yankees are going away. They're now in front five to one. And Mancuso walks sadly out to the mound. Hubble is finished. And back in the dark resources of the giant bullpen will come another of Terry's mound crew to assume a burden which apparently was left in the last game of the 1936 series. It seems as though we are right back beginning today where we left off last fall. The conference out there on the mound. Hubble still standing around. Whitehead has come in from second. Bartell, Mancuso. Harry Gumbert. Harry Gumbert, a tall young right-hander, is coming in to relieve Paul Hubble. Eight of the Yankees faced Hubble in the last of this sixth inning. Seven of them got safely on, and five of them have scored. Harry Gumbert. Very tall, making that long walk. The bullpen for the Giants is hidden in the stands behind right center field. He has to make all that distance as he comes into the ball game. In other words, he gets pretty well acclimated before he ever gets to the mound. Gumbert first announced over the loudspeaker, and now Kaufman. And it is Dick as he steps to the mound. It's Dick Kaufman, the former American leaguer. Before the relief pitcher came into sight, Gumbert was announced as replacing Hubble. But after the pitcher came into sight, it was announced as Kaufman. Dick Kaufman, right-hander, who has been prominent as the Giants' number one relief man the last couple of years. Kaufman throwing down to Mancuso. We've had so much fireworks lately while Kaufman's limbering up. Warren, how have you seen it? Well, I, it seems a long time to go back that far, Red, but I'm still thinking about that play at second base when the ball got away from Dick Bartell after it seemed as though Mancuso had trapped him off, and it was amazing the way the Yankees leaped into action after that break, which was very definitely the break for which they've been waiting throughout this entire ball game. It's also interesting to me to note that when Gomez had his bad inning, which was the fifth, he managed to escape from there with one run. When it came time for the Yankees to tear after Hubble, one thing or another, combined with their own powerful hitting, particularly those singles, which were hit with a great deal of authority, certainly ruined his afternoon for him very rapidly. There was uh, one possible play in this inning, a play that uh, Whitehead tried to make on the ball Bill Dickey hit down. It was a slow hit ball, and Whitey made a noble try for the ball, diving after it, but he was unable to uh, get the ball and get it in time to make a play for anyone. It seems interesting to me, Red, at the present time that we've gone through an inning here with the Yankees making five runs, and so far there is no uh, semblance of their patented home run. It's been almost in one of these big innings of the Yankees. It seems as though somebody walks up there and hits one out of the park. Isn't that your impression of the Yankee big inning? Right you are, Warren. And uh, there's also some big stuff brewing down there, which uh, doesn't very often happen. Now, that... Uh mistake about announcing Gumbert as the relief pitcher is causing a furor, and I guess you know the technicalities involved. Of course, you go ahead and explain it, Warren. Well, after he becomes announced uh, officially as a pitcher, he is definitely the pitcher until at least he throws one ball. And when uh, Kaufman appeared on the mound, Art Fletcher, the Yankee coach, immediately went over and started 
complaining to the umpires about it, and the result was there was quite a conference. Now we have Gumbert back there. the way that thing works out. I think that's the first time in World Series history that I've seen anything like that. Frequently in baseball games, we've seen uh, a pinch hitter announced and go up to the plate, for example, a left-handed hitter going up to hit, and a pitching substitution is made, whereupon another announcement is made of a right-hand hitter, and the right-hand hitter takes his place at the bat without the left-hand hitter having been up there at all. But as far back as I can remember, this is the first time we've had a pitcher in the game without doing any more than warming up in the bullpen and walking all that long distance. And it certainly is a long distance from that uh, giant bullpen in right field. So that now that law and order has been restored again, we really do have uh, Harry Gumbert out there pitching. And I congratulate you, Red, on uh, detecting that even though Kaufman got in ahead of him. Well, thanks a great deal, Warren. And uh, I guess baseball is like life itself. You can never tell just exactly what's going to happen. First, uh, Gumbert is announced, and then a correction. And apparently that's all there is to it, uh, so most of the folks up here think that Kaufman's coming in to pitch. And then suddenly uh, a technicality is involved. And it involved, was involved, around whether the public address announcer was officially informed that Gumbert would pitch. And evidently he was, because that being the case, Gumbert has to pitch. Had the uh, announcer himself just on his own authority said Gumbert would pitch, that wouldn't have had any bearing. And now up there now is Lazare. But the throw goes over to first base as Gumbert officially goes to work. Harry Gumbert, the former Baltimore Oriole, throws again to first base. Here's the situation here in the last of the sixth. With one man out, Selkirk is at first, and Hogg is at third. The Yankees are riding out in front, 5-2-1. Up there at the plate in a crouch is the right stick. Gumbert delivers inside for ball one. And now technically, Gumbert is in the ball game. He's delivered one pitch to Tony Lazari. Outfield around toward left. The Yankees lead off first and third. A curve floating down in there for call strike one. Jared looking at it and takes it. Tony hit back to Hubble in the second inning and was promptly tossed out at first. And then Hub struck him out in the fifth. That was when Hub wound up his great sequence of 14 straight Yankee victims. And that was the last of that string. The Yankees put on a string of their own here in the last of the sixth. There's a slow ball hit through second base to the right center field. And in from third comes Hall. Around the third goes Selkirk. A change of pace was met with a half swing by Tony Lazari, who was trying to hit behind the runner, and he singled through the middle, right underneath Burgess Whitehead, who was running up on it. And in comes another run, and the Yankees are now plus five, leading 6-2-1. And Gomez, who was first up in the last of the sixth, is now coming up for his second trip in the last of this inning, the tenth Yankee to bat, and just one man is out. A single right back through the middle by Lazari. That's in still another Yankee run. And Gumbert, who had to come out and pitch to one man, now is taken out, and Kaufman comes in. Kaufman, number 14, now pitching for the Giants. And now at long last, as the fellow once said, Kaufman is in the ball game. Dick Kaufman comes into the ball game, and as he comes in, the Yankees are ahead 6-1. to one. Gumbert fits to one by now. Lazari, who singled and knocked in the Yankees' sixth run. Up now is Gomez, who was first up in the last of the sixth and drew a walk. The fateful pass. Gomez hitting left-handed. Dick Kaufman, tall, rugged, right-handed. Off first is Lazari. Off third, Selkirk. Gomez says Kaufman's taking a little too much time, so he stepped back out of the box. On, of course, calls time. The outfield a little toward left. Swinging, strike one. Kaufman came down with a slant, just above the knees on the inside. Gomez chokes that bat just about an inch, pumps it back and forth. John Enfield pulled right up on the base pass. Low inside for ball one, right across the shins. One and one. 
Fletcher. Jumping up and down, back of third. He's very, very elated. Looks as though he's filled with the elixir of life. The pitch is low. And it's ball two. Two and one. Six to one. In favor of the Yankees. Six runs in the last of the sixth. And apparently, that isn't all. Gomez and the crouch. Takes low, and it's ball three. Three and one. Hoffman. Punishing a big two of the backer. That's the point of his jaw out there. Very belligerently. Now walks around back of the mound. Kicks a little dirt. Pulls the peak of his cap down snugly over his eyes. Spits into the black loam topsoil. The Yankee Stadium. Looks toward first. Toward third. Now delivers. 3-1. Low for ball four. Vice Gomez has walked here in the last of the sixth inning. And this reloads the bases. Still just one out. Gomez, twice up here in the last of the sixth, is both times given an Annie Oakley to first base. This pushes. Lazari down to second. And Selkirk down to third. Selkirk already at third. Base is full. One out. The batter is Frank Pazetti, who singled sharply once in this six already, up for a second time. Takes him way outside. Ball one. A little shortstopper from the Yankees. Choking that walk left. Standing right off the plate. Easily balanced. The base is just as full as a tenement house in the busy district. Up and right hands it down, and it's swung on and ball tipped back. One and one. Gomez at first, Lazari at second, Selkirk at third. Mancuso goes out to talk to Kaufman. Infield lazily passing the ball around between themselves. This has been a severe jolt to the Giants, this last of the sixth inning. And the Yankees are still the Yankees, running absolutely according to form in the dope sheet. No variations at all. Hoffman comes down. Cresetti swings. It's a fly ball into short left field. Up comes Joe Moore on the dead run. Andre makes the catch, and the runners are forced to hold where they are. The throw in is cut off two-thirds of the way toward the plate by third baseman Mal Ott. That's out number two here in the last of the sixth inning. Red Roth hitting left-handed steps up. Two men gone here in the last of the sixth. Base is full. Copper drying off the fingers of his right hand. Lost pulls that black cap down snug around his ears. Pumps that stick back and forth. I feel a little toward right. Pitch it outside, a change of pace. Ball one. Set. Easily balanced. He has one for three this afternoon. Takes low inside. Ball two. It was Kaufman's fastball. The sights were not quite high enough. This vast throng, many, many thousands, here at Yankee Stadium. Wildly hilarious. And even a foul ball through the first five and a half innings has sort of settled back. Either completely filled to a point of satiation with happiness, or else completely crushed. Go inside for ball three, and with the bases loaded, Kaufman is behind two red rods. He hasn't hit his target once. Three and all. He misses once more, walks in a run. There's a strike. Just on the knees on the inside. 3-1. Bob stepping back out of the box, stepped in again. And Cuso down on his crouch, calls for it. The runners don't lead down very far. Now they start streaking off. Gomez isn't cutting up down at first. He's conserving his energies. The pitch. 
outside for ball four and a walk to Ralph with the bases full. And in comes another Yankee run. Ralph is credited with batting in that run. 7-2-1 in favor of the Yankees. Six runs to the good. Selkirk scored on that play. Sarri moving down to third and Gomez to second. Up now is Joe DiMaggio. Swings. It's a high fly ball deep out into center field. Lieber goes back and pulls it down. Well, that's all for the first six innings. And it looks like it might be all for the afternoon. However, a ball game is never over until the last man is out. But first, before anything else is said by Warren Brown, we pause for station identification. Back at the Yankee Stadium, and this ball game coming to you through the National Broadcasting Company and its associated stations has certainly provided a big inning, finally, after we remained around here for upwards of five and a half innings watching quite a pitching duel between Lefty Gomez and Kyle Hubble. The Yankees certainly caught up with Hubble in that last inning when they secured six runs and seven hits. Not all of them, of course, all for Hubble, for he was gone, and during the balance of the inning, we had two giant pitchers in there. Harry Gumbert, who seemed to come in because of a mistake in identity on his way from the bullpen, and Dick Kaufman, who finished up for the game. There were a few bases on balls crowded into that inning, and certainly one break, which went against uh, Hubble at the time he was in there. However, full credit must go to the Yankees for the ability with which they leaped to the attack once they had an opening, and it was the first opening in the game that Hubble had given them. All right, Red. Lefty Gomez is ready now to start the seventh, pitching to Jimmy Ripple. He does strike one call. Sharp breaking curve just above the knees. Ripple has one for two this afternoon. He started off what looked to be the Giants' beginning of the fifth for the single. Takes low outside, it's one and one. Gomez has never lost a World Series ball game. And it looks as though he'll still be able to camp on that record for another few hours. Seven to one, favor of the Yankees. Triple swinging, foul tips it back. Right two, one and two. First giant up from the seventh. Yankees ahead seven to one. After Ripple, McCarthy, then Mancuso. Infield straight away. Up a step on the left side. Full depth on the right. Outfield a couple of steps toward right on Jimmy. Full hitter. Swings. There's a fly ball going out into left. Hold coming up fast. Takes it on the run. It's all for Ripple. One up, one going to the seventh. That is McCarthy. He has one for two. He singled through Lazari in the fifth inning to send Ripple around to third base. Jimmy later coming in on Mancuso's double play ball. The only run the Giants have. McCarthy, a rookie, takes strike one call. This has been his rookie year in the big leagues. And at the end of his first year in the majors, here he is in the World Series, and he has one for two at the moment, up for his third time. Swings and misses at a curve, strike two. Missed that one off the end of his bat. They're playing McCarthy, just as they did Ripple as far as the outfield is concerned, toward right, left side of the infield the same, and Lazari is a step or so more down toward first. High inside, on the chest for ball run. One and two, McCarthy. Very slender. Big Bill Dickey sets his mitt. The ball is bounced easily back to the mound. Gomez traps it, throws over to first. That's all for young John. Getting back to the box. Two up, two gone, top of the seventh. Hitter is Gus Mancuso. Comes back out of batter's box. Takes the meat end of his stick. Knocks the dirt out from his spikes. Now stepping in, close over against the catcher. Fences straight away. Strike one called. A little hook was snapped in just above the knees on the inside. Right hand hitter. Gomez. Elongated, slender left-hander. Delivers. Fastball inside. One and one. Gomez draws up his knees almost under his chin. Flails those arms around in back of him. Ties himself up into such a knot you wonder how in the world he ever gets out of it. Delivers. Inside. Ball two. Two and one. 
Lefty pitching just as he has all the afternoon. Taking the sign, then going right to work. Takes time out for a blow right now. Looks into the dirt as though he were reading a letter from home. Straightens up, blows again. And this time, it's Mancuso who backs away. He said, well, have the blows on me this time. Just steps in. Double swinging stretch. Gomez delivers. Mancuso hits it high out into short center field. DiMaggio comes running under it and takes it. And it's nothing across for the Giants in the top of the seventh. And more observations from Warren. almost any ball club down for the time being. Naturally, with Gomez being as effective as he has been throughout his American League season and throughout this ball game, with the exception of the fifth inning, it was uh, hardly likely that the Giants were going to cut loose and have any big inning off of him any more than it was that the Yankees were going to have one off of Carl Hubble. But that, to me, is one of the reasons why there are probably more than 60,000 people here looking at this baseball game. One never knows what is going to happen in a ball game. At the very minute that Hubble walked Gomez, who was a pitcher, no one suspected that he was due for the trouble that happened. And so, Red, looks like they're ready to start again, maybe on Kaufman this time. Dick Kaufman ready to pitch to Lou Gehrig. And does so, call strike one, buzzing it down just above the knees on the outside. Gehrig has all for two official trips. The only time he got on was in the sixth with a deliberate walk. Later came around to be scored. Out to very deep, round toward right. Columbia Lou, tremendous favorite here. Sets, expecting one inside up against him tight for ball one. One and one. Dick Kaufman, the third of the giant pitches. In the ball game and in the sixth inning. Now working, starting the last of the seventh. Gehrig swinging, it's a sky-high foul up on top of the stands in the back of third base. Hits up at the edge of the upper facade and drops all the way back. Like a bum. Oh, that's one bum. The people weren't dodging. They were fighting to get close to it. Hoffman comes down with a change of pace. Just missing outside. Count levels it two and two. Gehrig certainly had to lay the engineering eye on that one. Dick delivers. Missing inside, it's 3-2. Garrick turns a little bit toward right field. Digs in solidly, standing on those piano legs of his. Takes outside for ball four. And Garrick has walked first up in the last of the seventh. That's walk number three. Given up by Kaufman. Walk number six given to the Yankees. Nobody out. Last to the seven. Gehrig now leading down off first. Bill Dickey, who has one hit out of three tries. Stands waiting. Batting left-handed. Very, very tall and slender for a catcher. Outfield toward right. Dickey pulls. Infield pull up around second. Bill takes a curve outside, ball one. Hoffman missing. Seven, two, one. In favor of the Yankees. Nobody out last the seventh, the man on first. Low for ball two. Hoffman's having trouble with his control. It's no new experience for Hoffman to be pitching against the Yankees. It's most of his major league career has been in the American League. Washington to the Browns. Being released by the St. Louis Browns, came over to the National League with the Giants. Pitches inside. There's a throw down to first, not in time, by Mancuso. And it's 3 nothing. 3 nothing to Bill Dickey. Gary going first with a pass. Dickey set. Kaufman misses inside with his 3-0 pitch for ball four, and Dickey trots off to first base, and Gehrig moves down to second. Of the 
six Yankees that Kaufman has pitched to. He's walked four of them. Dick Ambles back onto the mound. Bill Terry standing out in front of the giant dugout. Looks down into the dirt for the moment. Imagine Bill doesn't feel like joining a choir and singing one of his now famous solos. Rider up is Merrill Hogue, who drops a bunt down toward third and rolls foul. Strike one. Nobody out. Last to the seven. Seven to one, favor the Yankees. Gary on second, Dickey on first. Result of passes by second relief pitcher Dick Kaufman. Much attention was focused on the relief pitchers in the last of the sixth inning. And there was a slip up on the general ship somewhere. Gumbert was announced, and he was sitting in on the dugout. Hadn't thrown a ball, hadn't even been in the bullpen. He had to hurriedly go out and pitch to one Yankee, even though Kaufman was announced following him. Kaufman couldn't come in until Gumbert had pitched to one man. Now Hogue, a right-hand hitter, takes high outside. A throw down to second. Isn't in time. And Bartell, on the third base side of second base, leaning for the ball, has Husky Lou Gehrig come right into him, much as an end tries to take out an opposing tackle. Gary's fighting to get back to the bag, and little Bartell in his way. Well, you can guess the result. Gary got back to the bag. One and one. Hogue down in his crouch. He has 0 for 3. Doesn't choke the bat. Tries to bunt, and this one is popped foul back of third. So far, the Yankees this afternoon have been unable to lay down bunts when ordered. And and then have been hitting with two strikes on the base hits. It seems to be a pretty good baseball strategy. It's working today anyhow. Working at a thousand. Now can Ho continue the Yankee policy? One and two. Nobody away. The runners lead off first and second. Huffman twirls is over throw back to second. But he doesn't. Gary taking a long lead. There's a ground ball hit to third. Ott scoops it up towards the second one away. The relay on the first. It's a double play. Gary moving down to third base. And Hogue was unable to continue that Yankee policy so far of the sixth inning. Trying to bunt, fouling off two pitches, then hitting safe. He fouled off his two bunt pitches, then hit into a double play. Ott to Whitehead to McCarthy. Gary on the double play, moving down to third, and two out, back to the seventh. Up now is Selkirk. Turn sharp and toward right. Swing, about it, bends around, like one. George has one for three. His single came in the sixth, with all but one of the Yankee hits came. There was a sharp one wrapped through the hole between first and second out in the right field. Outside, ball one. One and one. Two out. Gehrig on third, 90 feet away. The Yankees lead seven to one. Outfield pulled around toward right. Shelker takes a change of pace low. Two and one. Ormsby working balls and strikes. Paw behind first. Basil behind second. Stewart behind third. Huffman comes in. It's an outside pitch, which is rolled down to short. Bartell picks it up, throws over to first, in time. McCarthy leaning in, makes the stretch and the pickup. That's all for the Yankees. And at the end of seven innings, it is 7-2-1. One. one. Well, Red, that was interesting to watch how Kaufman righted himself after that bad start out there. Since he got into this ball game, as you pointed out, he certainly was very wild. And after he walked the first two men in the inning... That seemed to me to be the opportunity for the Yankees to start a lot more trouble there. But uh, the play that Art made to turn that uh, drive by Hogue into a double play helped Kaufman out considerably. And I suppose that the Yankees are content with what they have now, and I don't know as I blame them. Seven runs at this uh, part of the ball game going into the first half of the eighth inning seem to be a lot of runs, considering the way that Gomez has been going since he started this ball game. Well, there's the first giant hitter coming up, Red, so back to you. Burgess Whitehead will start it off as he 
run at the beginning of the eighth. At the end of seven full innings, for the Yankees, seven runs, seven hits, and no errors. While for the Giants, one run, five hits, and one error. Burgess Whitehead, who has so far the only extra base hit, takes strike one, call, right down in there. First pitch of the eighth inning. He doubles. Last time up, he has one for two. Swinging, it's a fly ball out into center field. DiMaggio waiting lazily under it and has it. It's all for Burgess. One up, one away in the eighth. And Wally Berger is coming out to bat for Kaufman. Big Wally Berger, former big fam of the Boston Club of the National League. Well, there's not going to be any slip-up on who's going to pinch hit. Umpire Hornsby and the public address announcer meet, and they tell each other exactly what's coming off. Number three, five, four, five. The first pitch to Berger is high outside, ball one. Wally is the big strapping six-footer, hitting right-handed. Gomez delivers. Berger swings. It's a high fly ball, long out in the center. DiMaggio waiting, waiting, takes it. So for Berger. Two up, two away. Top of the eighth. Jojo Moore, the thin man of the Giants, or the Gauze Ghost, as he's sometimes called. Last steps up to hit for his fourth time. It means the Giants are starting their fourth batting around. Joe single through the middle in the sixth. He has one for three. Hitting left-handed, then deep in the box. Takes strike one, call. Sharp curve down above the knee. Moore is feared as one of the most dangerous first ball hitters in baseball, and he hasn't swung on a first pitch this afternoon. Takes low inside. Ball one. One and one. Joe pumping that stick. The pitch low outside. Was ahead. No man behind. Gomez comes in there. Low for ball three. Three and one. Swinging, it's a high foul. Back of third. Cross goes over, but he cannot get it. Back into the boxes. Still 3 2. Two out, nobody on. Chart half of the eighth inning, which is the first of the eighth. The series is being opened in Yankee Stadium, the American League ballpark this year. The Yankees, the home club. 7 to 1. The argument. Uh, power supremacy. 7 to 1, favor the Yankees. Four swings on another 3 2 pitch. This is a fly ball into short left field, and it drops safely in there for a base hit. Moore turns to the left at first and then holds on. Dropping a fly ball single in short left field, about 15 feet inside the foul line. That's the second straight hit for Moore. He's the first giant to have more than one blow. It's hit number six off Gomez, and it's the first hit off Gomez since White hit doubled two out of the fifth. Two out, more leading off first, and the batter is Dick Bartell. There's one for three. Swings on the first pitch. It's a long line drive deep into left, and it's caught right back up against the stands by left fielder Hope. It's all for the top of the eighth. The Yankees are still a plus six run. One. the effective pitcher that he has been right down the line. That base hit that Joe Moore dropped over there in the left field wasn't such a severe one that, should have, that it would have startled anybody. And in all events, it came when there were two out, which is a good time normally for base hits to come, especially when there are no one on base. Since his uh, little mishap in the fifth inning, Gomez has gone right straight through this ball game and he's pitched... I wouldn't say remarkable baseball, but he's pitched the kind of baseball that people have been expecting from him. Because of the fact that Wally Berger was used as a pinch hitter in the game, we will have a chance this afternoon to look at uh, four of the giant pitchers. 
then, Red, because we can never be sure who the uh, giant pitchers are after that uh, practice that was established through the sixth inning. Suppose you take a look at him out there and decide whether or not he's Smith. He looks like Smith to me. Do you think he is Smith? Well, if he's not Smith, uh, Warren, he's certainly wearing Al's uniform. It looks just like him. Al Smith. Turned out of a little left-handed third ball artist. And he's fourth giant pitcher. Thrown against the Yankees here in the first game of the 1937 World Series. Smith has just taken his place there on the mound. This is going down to Gus Van Fusel. In the season of 36, Smith was just about tops for the giant relievers. One time, Bill Terry said that he was just about the best relief pitcher that he ever saw, especially coming in there with a curveball. However, this year, Al has not been tremendously effective. And the relief burden among the Giants has had to be uh, shifted around from man to man. However, it's a well-known fact that when the Giants want some real relief pitching, Hubble has usually been the fellow who went out there and made one run stand up. First Yankee up in the last of the eighth inning is Tony Lazari. Lots of people are now beginning to leave. We're going to the last of the eighth inning. Lazari hitting right-handed. Swings on an inside pitch, missing for strike one. A steady stream of people trying to beat the mob, which will be pouring out of Yankee Stadium in six more outs. Now leaving already. Sarah takes low inside. One and one. Al Smith coming on for the last of the eighth. And it's the New York Yankees. Seven runs the New York Giants. One. Seven to one. Smith comes down. High. Two. Two and one. Al's very stocky. Throws... Uh, Sort of side off. Doesn't wind up. Outfield is toward left on Lazari. Tony takes up against him for ball three. Three one. Smith taking the return from Mancuso back slowly back to the mound. Al comes down. It's in there. Swung on and hit deep and far back into left. And it's a home run for Lazari. A fat pitch, as the boys say, that 3 1 came down in there and did Lazari go after it and get fat on it. The first home run of the 1937 World Series. Hit high, far into the lower spectators, deep behind left field. And well up among them. No question about that. And now it's 8-1. to one. And Gomez is up. Swings and misses. Strike one. About the one thing left to make Gomez's cup of joy overflow is to get a base hit. He, like any other pitcher, dearly loves him. Gets back from one up against him. One and one. Lazari. Really pickled one for keeps. Just a moment ago. Smith comes down with a curve in there. Ball strike two. That one drove Gomez. Left hand hit a banker step and then broke away from him and down over cleanly. One ball, two strikes. Nobody out. Gomez falls away from a pitch, pulls it deep into right field, and Ripple, misjudging it, then goes back to make a spectacular catch. Gomez, set to hit that pitch, fell into it and got his whole weight behind it and drove it deep out into right. Ripple came in, misjudged it at first, then saw the ball was going to carry it far over his head, started running back. One foot slipped underneath him, but still he managed to get strength from somewhere and leap high into the air to make a spectacular one-handed catch and save himself. Frank Rossetti hits the first pitch of line drive right to Mellon. And that's two away in the last of the eighth inning. Warren's going to tell you more about Ripple's catch. I can see him sort of licking his chops in preparation for that. Line drive hit Frank Rossetti to Mellon for the second out. Now it's two away, last of the eighth inning. Nobody on it, Red Roth up. He has one, four, three official tries. Hitting left handed, he tries to butt and foul tips it. Strike one. Left hand batter, left hand pitcher, Al Smith, the fourth giant hurler in this ball game. 
That's the sixth inning. Eight to one. In favor of the Yankees. I feel straight away. Drop doesn't go after it, but it's good. Ball strike two. Smith burnt that one through his fastball. Ripple put it deep out and right. Drop down in his crouch. Leads back from one inside. Ball one. One and two. Drop up there hitting. DiMaggio leaning down on his right knee on deck. Drop cocks that stick back in his left ear. Swings. It's a high fly ball out into left field. Joe Moore goes back one step. Now comes in one and has it. That's all for the last of the eight. Warren? Fred, I noticed that you suggested that I was going to talk something about that catch that uh, Ripple made in this inning. First, I want to say that this inning stirred memories in me rather than uh, excited me about what happened here. When Tony Lazari got his home run this afternoon, the first one of the 1937 World Series, I was thinking about one that he made last year, which came with three men on bases. That was truly a sensational one, since that doesn't happen very often in World Series history. When Ripple started after that ball out there, believe it or not, Red, I was thinking of the catch he made in Chicago not long ago with three men on bases at a time when some of us thought that the pennant lay between the Giants and the Cubs. And if he hadn't made that catch with those three men on bases, why, well, maybe there would have been a little different in here. I think that's the way everybody accepted it, so that when Ripple went up in the air and caught Gomez's long drive, much as I hated to see Gomez lose and his life's ambition to make a base hit, I couldn't help think of that catch in Chicago. So now back to you. Mallott takes the first pitch of the ninth inning. Ball strike one. Gomez looking just as strong and fresh as when he started. Comes right back in. Ott swings and misses. Last one burnt down around the knees. Strike two. Gomez gives his trousers to a little yank. Straightens up. Knees and elbows to Kimbo. He comes out of it. Strike three swinging. And on three pitches, Master Melvin is struck out to start the ninth inning. That's the second strikeout for Gomez. He got his first strikeout at the expense of Hank Lever. For the third out in the first inning. And here is Hank up again. Hank has 0 for 3. The Yankees ahead 8 to 1. One out, nobody on top of the ninth. John's batting. Lever takes. Go outside. Ball one. Gomez still shining brightly underneath that record of his of having never been beaten in World Series competition. Inside, and it's ball two. Two nothing. Now, field is very deep on Hank. If he gets a hold of it, he'll give it a ride. Pitch, right in. That one is taken. Two and one. A steady stream of people going out of every possible exit here at Yankee Stadium. They figured some time ago the outcome of the game was decided. Lever swings. It's a fly ball out of the center. DiMaggio coming in, makes the catch on his chest. Two away, top of the ninth. Up steps Jimmy Ripple, who found Major League Baseball was much more lucrative and pleasant than being an ambidextrous paper hanger. Up field toward right. Triple hitting left handed, takes inside against him, all one. Jimmy looking very calm and cool. To say that he is a left-handed hitter is only half the truth. The pitch, call strike one. When Ripple came to the Giants, he hit from either side of the plate. Terry insisted that he hit as a left-handed swinger. Low, outside, one and two. Count slightly in his favor. Two out, top of the ninth. Nobody on. The Yankees, seven runs to the good, leading eight to one. Two balls and one strike. Gomez delivers. Low outside, and it's three and one. Ripple looking very coolly. It's one for three this afternoon. Single, first up in the fifth inning. Ball four. Walk going down to first base. And that's the first base on balls given up by Lefty Gomez. This afternoon, seven of the Yankees received gratuities. Ripple on first, two out. Batter is young Jack McCarthy. 
Now, John, if you don't know him very closely, swings and misses. Strike one. That one right down in there. Coffee, slender, young first baseman. He's finishing his first year in the majors by participation in the World Series. Swings, foul tips that one back for strike two. Gomez has promptly gone ahead of him with his first two pitches. Nothing in two to McCarthy. Dickey down in his crouch. First baseman Gehrig back in his fielding post. Purple's allowed to lead his ball off first he wants to. High outside, ball one. One and two to McCarthy. Gomez at the moment seems to be just slightly tired. He gives you the impression that he is trying to put a little bit more on the ball than he has any other time. Pitch is high. Two and two. Two, two. Two out. Top of the ninth. Carthy waiting. Dickey calls to the pitch. Carthy swinging. Foul tips it right back onto the screen. Count still hangs at two and two. Field pull toward right. Things are quiet right now. About the only hubbub from the spectators are those who are moving, trying to get out of the park. Pitch misses outside by a hair for ball three. And it's three and two to Jack McCarthy. And now the run and hit is on for Ripple at first base. He'll be breaking on Gomez's arm. He does. Pitches in. Rolls slowly down toward first. Gary comes in the field. It picks it up. And tags McCarthy out as Jack comes running into first base. Gary with a big grin on his face. Stuffs that baseball in his hip pocket. Grabs Gomez by the hand. The two of them shake hands and are the first players off the field as they dash into the Yankee dugout and disappear from sight. And the Yankees win, would you say convincingly? Well, I don't know of a better word. And to speak a convincing truth, it's been a great deal of pleasure for this old uh, redhead to be up here talking to you the last four innings. And now this is Red Barber handing you over to the very capable hands of Warren Brown, who is going to put you just right on how everything happened this afternoon and plenty of it did. Warren. Well, thank you, Red. And summing up this ball game, the first of the 1937 World Series, it was, after all, strictly a matter of pitchers. It started out that way between Lefty Gomez, the best pitcher, I suppose, in the American League, and Carl Hubble, who was certainly the superior left-hander in the National League. Right up until the sixth inning, it was a ball game between these two. And if anything, Hubble seemed to be the more effective of the two. In the fifth inning, the uh, New York Giants had crowded Gomez sufficiently to score one run, which looked like a lot of runs. In that inning, manager Joe McCarty of the Yankees, who has steered them to a couple of pennants in a row and one world championship, had to make up his mind whether he wanted to pull his infield back and play for a double play and stake the Yankees to, or the Giants, I should say, to one run and take his chance on what would follow. That's what he did, pull his infield back, and Gus Mancuso hit into a double play. Out of that, the Yankees were able to escape with only having the one run scored against them, which came in on the double play, and that was the one big inning, or the start of one big inning, that the Giants were able to have off Gomez all afternoon. On the other side of the field, Hubble, after uh, walking one man and allowing a hit in the first inning, was uh, unhittable right on through to the sixth inning. Then he did a thing which baseball folk always think, uh, since there is a lot of superstition in baseball, they always think that if you walk the first man, and especially if you walk the pitcher, there's going to be trouble. I don't think that any of the more than 60,000 people in this Yankee Stadium this afternoon suspected that when Lefty Gomez got his base on balls to open the sixth inning, that there was going to be quite as much trouble as there was until the last man was retired. Before the last man was retired in that inning, the Yankees had driven Hubble out of the box, and because of a mistake in announcement, Harry Gumbert was in there in time to pitch to one man who got a base hit off him, and Dick Kaufman finally got the inning over. Before he did, there were seven runs scored and six hits. And that was the ball game. Later on in the game, in the eighth inning, with a fourth giant pitcher in action, Al Smith, Tony Lazari, batted out the only home run and, incidentally, the only Yankee extra base hit of the ball game. That made the score eight for the Yankees, 
at which they rested on their laurels in this first game. And looking over my scorebook here, I find that the Yankees have eight runs and eight hits, which seems to me to be a very effective way of doing business. Going into the game tomorrow, which will also be played at the Yankee Stadium, the second game of the series, I don't imagine either manager will change from his plans. Before the game today, Bill Terry told me that he intended to come in with Cliff Melton, and I imagine he will come in with him, Melton being the young left-hander who has won his 20 games in his first full year up here in the major leagues. Joe McCarty of the Yankees said that he intended to pitch red roughing tomorrow, and Joe was inclined to go a little further. When he talked to me, Joe was an old friend of mine, and he spoke his mind out to me down there in the Yankee dugout before the game. He said that he didn't think that he would go away from a platform that he established uh, rather effectively last year. He said that it would be Gomez today, roughing tomorrow, and after that, Monty Pearson and Bump Hadley. And unless the Giants pull themselves together and tear after Melton, I imagine that's the way the Yankees will go through with the same four pitchers that they used in the World Series last year. The uh, game t today was certainly an interesting one. There was a lot of spectacular fielding on both sides. And while there wasn't the tremendous burst of hitting that we've been led to expect from these two clubs, and particularly from the Yankees, who have capitalized on their power to win an American League pennant off by themselves, nevertheless... They did mass together and put across one big inning. All right, George Hicks, I'll say goodbye now, and it's yours. Well, all I can say is that the game is over and that historical first marker is down. The tips are down and the Yanks are up. And the crowd is now pouring out. By the time the game was well underway by the second inning, practically every seat in the Yankee Stadium was filled. There must have been close to... Uh, the 60,000 mark and over. The new additions, you know, seats 71,000 at Yankee Stadium now. And so we've had the first game right now as we look down from our tier, the third tier right at the edge over home plate. The diamond itself and the green outfield is simply uh, dotted and spotted all over and the exits crowded with these thousands of spectators who are taking home their memories of the first game of the 1937 World Series. Uh, as I looked at it, uh, very much of a spectator this afternoon, the walk of Gomez in the sixth and that slashing single to center by DiMaggio with the bases loaded for the first runs, well, I think that broke Hubble's heart and the giant spirit for the game today. And uh, by the way, the only homer today was Lazares, the first man up in the eighth. He pulled a terrifically long and high homer into the left field grandstand. It must have gone at least 400 feet uh, no, nobody on, but that was the homer of the day. And uh, so I guess that's about all we can say. This has been brought to you by the NBC and its associated stations from coast to coast. We'll be back on the air tomorrow, of course, with the second game from the same position at Yankee Stadium. As you know, the first two games are played at the stadium, and then the third, fourth, and if there is a fifth, at the Polo Grounds, and the sixth and seventh at the Yankee Stadium if necessary. We'll be back on the air tomorrow at our regular time, 1.15 Eastern Standard Time. That's 12.15 Central, 11.15 Mountain, 10.15 Pacific Standard Time. Your announcers will be Tom Manning of Cleveland, Red Barber of Cincinnati, and Warren Brown, sports editor of the Chicago Herald Examiner. And so, well, that's all. Till tomorrow, George Hicks announcing this program is brought to you through the National Broadcasting Company. We wish to thank the American Home Products Corporation, makers of Old English Wax, Louis Philippe Leapstick, and Colonos Toothpaste, Sterling Products Incorporated, makers of Philips Facial Cream, McKesson and Robbins, makers of k Tooth Powder, and the Procter & Gamble Company, makers of Camay, Oxidol, Crisco, and Ivory Soap, for their courtesy in relinquishing the time for their programs usually heard over some of these stations, in order that the National Broadcasting Company might bring you a description of the World Series baseball game.